co-founder co of the elders. Madam President, my dear Fernanda Gassish, Mr. Secretary General Antonio Guterres, Excellencies, Heads of States and Heads of Government, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my singular honor to address this esteemed collective home of the human family. I would like to thank President Espinoza Garces and the Secretary General Guterres for calling this special session to celebrate Nelson Mandela's life and his legacy of peacemaking. Thank you for this privilege. I stand here not as a diplomat, but as a human rights advocate and concerned citizen of the world. So forgive me in advance for the unrestrained manner in which I will share my frank thoughts with you today. This celebration of the legacy of Nelson Mandela, Madiba, as we affectionately know, provides an appropriate opportunity to reflect on the very reason death of the United Nations. In October 1945, the founding members of the United Nations pledged first and foremost, I quote, we the peoples of the United Nations are determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind and to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights and the dignity and worth of the human person in the equal rights of men and women and of nations large and small, unquote. It strikes me with the gratifying humility that at this moment of reflection, we associate Nelson Mandela as a reference point to help guide us in fulfilling this supreme mandate. Indeed, Madiba's legacy as a freedom fighter, peacemaker, and statesman speaks to the core of our greatest aspirations for the United Nations and for humanity. To celebrate Madiba's life and his contributions to the world is twofold to take inspiration from the values he embodies and to emulate his unwavering commitment to freedom, equality, justice, and dignity for all. Let me pause here and bring to mind the legacy of Kofi Annan, my dear brother and fellow elder, who also embodied the values of the U which the UN holds dear. His moral fortitude and commitment to justice should also serve as inspiration to shape the international community into a more stable, peaceful, and equitable one. The United Nations finds itself at a time where it would be well served to revisit and reconnect to the vision of its founders as well as to take direction from Madiba's servant leadership and courage. His example of a servant leader reminds us that no sacrifice is too great to ensure the respect and protection of one's people. He deeply believed that there is nothing more sacred than safeguarding the rights of all human beings. 
not the preservation of ego, not partisan politics, and not geopolitical considerations. An expert of brinkmanship and keen strategies, Madiba spent nearly three decades of his life as a political prisoner, and many years thereafter, negotiating the complexities of peacemaking and nation building. We seek inspiration from his successful approach. While staying true to his ultimate goal of freedom and social justice, he took the interests of his adversaries into consideration. He silenced his ego and took risks. He gave value to the principle of give and take and negotiated in good faith. The United Nations was shaped by our collective desire to prevent conflict and ensure that never and never again would war engulf nations the world over. Yet, more than 70 years later, today's news reels are full of conflict ridden headlines signaling significant discord within and our international community. Global security has deteriorated remarkably in the past decade. The number of armed conflicts has increased. And particularly worrisome to me are the protracted conflicts which have been ravaging our global family for decades. Our collective consciousness must reject the lethargy that has made us accustomed to death and violence as if wars are legitimate and somehow impossible to terminate. There's no justification for the loss of life and suffering in places like Syria, Yemen, Palestine, Somalia, South Sudan, Central African Republic and Myanmar, just to mention some. It has been far too long. Thousands of our children, just like our own sons and daughters, have been robbed of the joys of childhood. Thousands of women, no different from our own sisters and mothers, have been brutalized by rape as a weapon of war. Thousands of our fellow brothers and sisters have been needlessly maimed and killed. Thousands of families similar to our own have been ripped apart and left destitute. It is time to say enough is enough. Members of this esteemed chamber, do not let this be just another summit of statements Bold, unprecedented action must follow. As for me, the meaning of celebrating Madiba is to work to end this senseless violence as a matter of priority and urgency. I encourage you to interrogate and dismantle what is fueling these conflicts. The ego driven of decision makers the rigid political dogmas, greedy resource acquisitions, and the massive arms industry, just to name a few. It is time for every leader here to take responsibility. Those who are directly involved in the atrocities plaguing our world, those who take sides, and those who sit in silence. As leaders of this time, you have moral imperative and the ability to bring the death and destructions we witness on a daily basis to an end. Colombia proved it can be done. Others also can follow the example. History will judge you should you stagnate too long in inaction. Humankind will hold you accountable should you allow suffering to continue on your watch. I speak to you as a woman 
who has experienced firsthand the pain and misery of, of, of war. In 1996, on behalf of then Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali, I published a report on the devastating impact of armed conflict on children. My colleagues and I embarked on two years of research which brought to us, which brought us to conflict settings in every corner of the globe. I was just a mother then, horrified by stories of frightened children and grief-stricken mothers in the refugees and displaced camps. Today, I am a grandmother, still haunted by their eyes and still sitting with a heavy heart, knowing the fate of children in conflict settings has gotten worse. A voice of a Palestinian child still whispers to me when he asked, when this is going to end? And I know that that boy, now a young person, is still in a refugee camp, in a Palestinian camp. We cannot rest until we right these wrongs. And we need to work more collaboratively with those outside of this room to do so. We therefore actively support the Secretary General Antonio Guterres for putting peace at the highest of his agenda. Peacemaking does not only require political response, it equally requires the muscle of the private sector, civil society organizations, and the citizens at the grassroots as well. As an example, 25 years ago, an African institution, a court, was established to contribute to resolving Africa's conflict so as to create the conditions for human security, economic prosperity, and social cohesion. Today, after working on almost all of the Africa's protracted conflicts, we know that working towards peace alone will not deliver this. Peace, together with governance and development, is the only approach that can ensure stability. Therefore, in July of this year, the President of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa, and Accord launched a new initiative called Global Peace to take Accord's experience from Africa and the Global South and extend our solidarity across the world. Global Peace will make a modest contribution in transforming how nations drive development and stability. It will promote an ecosystem of innovators, influencers, investors, and implementers to generate innovative solutions to challenges of our time. This civil society initiative will complement the efforts of governments and multilateral agencies and strengthen multilateralism. When Madiba founded the Elders in 2007, he gave us a specific mandate, I quote, to support courage where there is fear, to foster agreement where there is conflict, and to inspire hope where there is despair, unquote. We elders spent the past year leading up to Madiba's 100th birthday, identifying and showcasing a hundred inspirational civil society organizations of all sizes and from all geographies. Each of these hundred organizations represents one of hundred ideas for a freer, fairer world. They work with a commitment to finding what unites their communities, and through collective efforts, they are achieving peace, justice, health and equality in their communities. On behalf of the elders, I have the honor to give this assembly with an inspiring publication featuring these sparks of hope, which I will hand over to President Espinosa Garcés and to Secretary General Guterres upon 
the conclusion of my remarks. This compendium highlights the moral courage and the leadership of change, of change agents across the world. And I hope you will take inspiration from their work to accelerate social transformation. In closing, I challenge you with Madiba's words. I quote, it is in your hands to make a better world for all who live in it, unquote. It is therefore incumbent upon you to live up to the cherished United Nations Charter, which demands of us, and I would like to quote again, save succeeding generations from the scourge of war and untold the sorrow to mankind and to reaffirm faith in the fundamental human rights in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women and of nations large and small. And I quote Madiba again, it is in your hands. I thank you.